Welcome to the EE Success Methods Podcast with Jacob and Aaron, your weekly dose of tips and tricks to achieve excellent performance in your business and career. Join us as we explore deeper into the practical worlds of Lean, Six Sigma, project management, and design thinking. In this episode number 205, a short parable, Beating the Deer Fly, The Price of Victory. If you're just tuning in for the first time, find all our back episodes on our podcast table of contents at esuccess-methods.com. If you like this episode, be sure to click the like link in the show notes. It's easy. Just tap our logo, click, and you're done. Tap, click, done. Here we go. Hey, everybody. This is Aaron. I'm sitting here on the beach. Well, actually, I'm sitting here at a picnic table in the shade, looking out over the beach where it was just too hot. Here watching my daughter play beach volleyball with a sore back during my quote-unquote vacation where I had intended to fully relax but now my back's been hurting for hmm, nearly half that time I decided hey I better do a little bit of something with my downtime I already finished my homework, or at least what I could continue, what I could complete while on the beach, and I tried to find a spot that's shady enough and far away enough from people, so that I don't look like that crazy guy talking to himself. But I probably still look like that crazy guy talking to himself. This episode came to me in a whim yesterday. I mentioned I'm suffering from a sore back, and that's. Uh, Uh, something completely of my making. I'm calling this Beating the Deer Fly, The Price of Victory. And that uh, small parable, I went for a run during the early part of my vacation uh, down a trail. I completed seven miles, I'm proud to say. Um, But uh, on my way back, it was a shaded area, marshy area. And when you are a piece of meat running through the jungle, you attract flies. So I attracted deer flies, and they were having their meal of me during half the way, and I just got tired of smacking them off my neck, and I was thinking to myself, you know, when I was younger, I used to be able to outrun these boogers. So I'm in about my last mile, and I said, all right, let's do it. Let's outrun these guys. So I did. I outran them. I made it through the shade, got out of the marshy area, emerged from the jungle until I hit the sunlight and said, okay, the deer flies are no longer here. I beat the deer fly. And then I finished my run. And, well, long story short, now I'm dealing with back pain. And that has everything to do with the fact that when I used to outrun them, I was 70 pounds lighter. And I had... Uh, I wasn't suffering from OMD. I used to call it early onset OMD. Nobody knew what that meant. Early onset old man's disease. So basically, I've tweaked my back by having it carry the load of my bouncing weight while running. So I'm dealing with that. So that's that's the price of victory. The pain that I feel as a result of winning. And it reminded me of Hell, it reminded me of my career. How many times have I succeeded in a project to only have it come back at me, maybe at the cost of my reputation with a company, um, political, political capital spent? So think about that. You know, as a Lean Six Sigma black belt or as an engineer being right versus being happy. This is a lesson I try to teach my daughters all the time. Would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Um, Sometimes you see she'll engage in an argument and she just won't quit because, well, she's a teenager, for one, but she won't quit because she thinks that the purpose of an argument is to be right. When at some point, to, to really win is to bow out of the argument. Would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? And some people will take righteousness all the way to the end, where the end is them being alone. So would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? In the career, it's kind of similar. There is often a technical right answer to a problem. 
And that technical right answer may not be the politically popular answer. And uh, I've tended to go with what I with I tended to err on the side of righteousness, and being, you know, hoping that well, if we just do this, we'll prove that it's right, and everyone will follow suit. And and it's given me a lot of success, but it's also made a what do we want to call it a an adversary out of me for those who should have been partners but uh, maybe frenemies is the right word some examples well I'll start with some some buddies so as a black belt I had a very good friend of mine probably yeah I'd say for sure the most successful black belt that I've ever met always came through on his projects doggedly would not quit until he found a solution and he would be the guy you'd go to for uh, problems that every other black belt gave up on before he took them on so i've you've probably heard me talk about the gold project and i really hope to get him on the podcast one of these times but long story short he found the gold everybody else missed it he found it victory for him but victory for him seemed to be at the expense of all the leaders who were responsible for that area and let the gold go, let the gold literally flush down the waste stream and that led to embarrassment and he used that success to help gain him a promotion to another area And that promotion to another area quickly led to him being removed from the company. So consider that victory. That was the cost of his victory. The political capital, even though he was right, even though he literally did what was best for the company, the leadership in their hubris could not accept that. And you might think that this is, well, this is just a, a company full of bad leaders. But I've seen it in every company I've been to. It's not just the one company. It seems to be endemic of leadership no matter where you go. Risk averse. Don't make me look bad. And I think that all of those leaders were probably like me and my friend at some point, And that's how they got to be leaders. Except that the rite of passage has, I'd say, more to do with age and knowing the right people than it has to do with doggedly going and um, succeeding at everything you do. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is when you when you reach that point in your executive vice president, maybe even C- COO, CTO, usually not CEO, CEO usually, um, I'd say they don't care about the embarrassment because they're already on top. But when you get down to the next level and the ones who are really worried about how they look to the CEO, that's where you start to see people protecting over protectionism in the ranks. And when you are put on a high profile project as the black belt, you know, it might be the kiss of death is actually success might be the kiss of death. Now, it doesn't have to be if you're politically uh, more astute than I and or my friend have been in the past. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to necessarily have success come at a personal price. Um, so anyway, when you get when you talk about the upper echelons and the cadre and the people who are looking to move up, when you get to the director, executive director, vice president level, it is all about, I guess the new term is optics. How does it look from somebody looking at this situation? And they're they're extremely cautious because they have a lot to lose. They're getting well paid. They're usually hitting their uh, mid fifties into sixties. They're in their the, the the top of their pay grade, top of their pay, um, with a short runway until retirement. And they're in an extremely vulnerable posi- vulnerable position. They need to bank as much cash as they can because they only got ten or fifteen years left. And if they end up out of a job, it's not a long enough runway for them to build up enough before retirement. So it's um, 
the leadership, this is now, this is all theory. This is what I believe, what I've witnessed, and I'm sure there's some studies around it, but um, there is correlation between age and this particular sort of mentality. And I've always hoped that it's not age and that I wouldn't change how I approach a job as a result of my age, but who knows? I'm not at that age yet. Anyway, consider this as uh, you go through your projects. Consider the political risks when you're looking at it. What is what is the cost of winning? You know, I've I've had when I was a quality manager at one of my companies, um, I found that the the quality system and our current approach to the market was completely at odds with what the customers were asking us to do, and management really just had no idea what our semiconductor customers were asking us to do. And uh, it came after a long trip. I gave a very in-depth analysis of where we stood and what our gaps were. And it took, uh, frankly, I guess my leadership team wasn't listening. So I, I started down this path without their consent. It was the right path, and it eventually led them to success. Now, let me let me qualify that. Did it lead me to success? No. No, because um, I ended up leaving that company before any success had come to fruition. And um, because of the quality gaps that I witnessed and the amount of change I needed to do in and around my department, um, I had to... I had to stop certain work that was being done by my department that should have belonged to somebody else. A, done differently by my predecessor. Uh, she had a lot of friends. Uh, and my approach to that job left me with less friends than she had, for sure. Um, I had to really challenge our engineering group in the quality of work that they were doing. And I probably challenged them too much. I got a little bit dogmatic, I'll say that for sure. Um, but uh, anyway, it uh, ended up, even though I was on the right track for where the company was, I was on the wrong track for where uh, people expected me to go. And, that was, and what people expected was for me to just do whatever else had to be done, do whatever was being done in the past, don't make waves, don't make changes, just maintain status quo and if I had known that I would have probably said hmm not the job for me because status quo is well it's not a four letter word but uh, it might as well be status quo I, I just hate complacency and status quo is not what I'm there for it's not what I am hired to do if you want to maintain something just give it to one of your uh first line operators or one of your first line supervisors they, they can maintain they can follow a script they can follow an op, uh, a procedure if you want change that's when you hire me you are listening to E6S Methods Podcast brought to you by E6S Industries join us on our website at www.e6s-methods.com journey through success did you know E6S Industries delivers custom training? We'll customize a program to meet your unique continuous improvement needs. We're also experienced keynote and motivational speakers to professional organizations and universities. Contact us on our website, www.e6s-methods.com, and let us help you chart your journey through success. If you want change, that's when you hire me. Change comes at a cost, though. And often that cost is, I guess, what, I, what I've what i described is, for one, people don't like change. And Kill the Messenger, the change bringer, is also the one who uh, pays the price, ultimately, for that change. Which is good if you are a independent consultant because you just move on to your next gig. Not so good if you plan on making a, a, a long-lasting career in the same place. So anyway, I'm in this position. I'm fairly new at it. Uh, I'm making changes. My The one guy who I, who really had my back was let go from the company, so I lost my uh, bit of support there. And then, let's see, what next? Um, 
I pissed off the engineering manager. I pissed off the operations manager. They started doing some work to, uh, well, uh, undercut me uh, in with the uh, COO, uh, along with my my who was my direct boss, who um, really, you know, his his thing was, hey, we all want to get paid, right? We all want to get our bonuses, right? And I said to him, yeah, I'd like to get paid, but I really need to do what's best for the company, too. So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, he was more interested in his annual bonus, less interested in what the customer wanted and the direction the co- company needed to go. So I ended up leaving that position of my own accord because I could just see uh, I was hitting dead ends everywhere I, everywhere I was going. Even though I actually was making a lot of success, but my legacy there was not going to be one that, uh, oh, not a lasting positive one, I suppose. It's positive for me in the manner that I actually did make a lot of improvements there, but um, my reputation there is hmm, not the one I would have hoped to leave. I have gotten some level of I don't know, call it begrudging satisfaction in that uh, after my departure there, they went through another quality manager in very short time and then another quality manager in very short time and they just kept spitting through these quality managers and then what was a team of me and two others turned into a team of a quality manager with a third of the responsibility plus 10 other engineers to support the customers that used to be supported by me and two other engineers, well, I guess three other engineers, but also I had other countries to deal with too. So this, uh, the scope of the role shrunk a ton and the support for the role grew a ton. So that's a little bit of, of satisfaction for me to look back and say, yeah, see, <laughs> it wasn't an easy job. Uh, and that's all directly a result of, of work that I had done that was in line with where the company needed to go, as well as upgrades to the facility that were, again, directly result from work that I had done, analysis that I had done. Um, Alas, though, I did say I left on my own terms, but I learned that I left on my own terms literally a day before I was about to be <laughs> be walked out the door, not on my own terms. So the good news is I got to save face and, and not uh, face the shame of being uh, let go. Um, but I, I, uh, I also didn't get the uh, package that I would have liked to get, the, the, the monetary separation agreement that uh, was... Uh, should have been mine, I suppose. I don't know, but I still, even though I didn't get fired, I kind of wish I was because I had, like, I had the money. Especially since I know I was fired, so it still hits the ego. Or, or know I was going to be fired, so it still hits the ego. But uh, anyway, part of my begrudging satisfaction is yes, there is a term out there that says shit rolls downhill. But I also believe that uh, leadership is always at fault. So shit may roll downhill, but toilets flush from the bottom, right? So consider me the piece of shit at the bottom. But uh, the floating shit still comes down. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to air this one. But anyway, so, yes, I was on the out. But then again, every single person who was working against me during that time has also gotten theirs. The operations manager is fired. The executive VP in charge of the area was fired. The engineering manager got demoted. The operations director got fired. The COO got fired. The president of that area got fired. There's literally only one person left who was involved in that whole thing who hasn't been let go yet. So that is me saying, yes, I may have been flushed first, but the system continues to flush until it finds the people really responsible for the poor runnings of the company. Now, I'll also say a lot of these people are the same people that were in charge of uh, the gold. So once leadership gets to the top, 
sometimes it takes a long time to get them out. Um, and they're not necessarily being the, the risk takers that we need them to be. So anyway, on paper, I won. I did what was best for the company on paper. Realistically, career-wise, I probably took too many hits, paid too much of a price as a result of winning for the company, winning for myself. I look back and I still say, yeah, you know, I, I still really did a good job. I had an amazing going away party. You know, for somebody who was about to be fired, a lot of people really came to, to wish me a good luck and goodbye. Um, yeah, for somebody who did such a, quote, bad job, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. But uh, the, some of the key people, you know, that uh, needed to change their ways, uh, those were the people who held the real power in the organization. And, you know, politically, there were things that I continually let myself get blindsided by. One of my great projects that saved a a multi-million dollar customer, multi-millions in revenue, frankly, our biggest customer, um, our biggest non-semiconductor customer, I almost single-handedly saved that relationship. And what did that do? That put me at odds with the VP of sales, the one who was about to lose that relationship, the one who actually got uninvited to that facility. That's the success. That's the price of success, the price of victory. And I continue to, I continually feel like I'm paying that price. Does anybody else find that in your change management and your change agent roles? You go through, you do what you're supposed to do, and you find yourself in a very difficult situation as a result. This is one of the reasons why I wrote my book, and I'll use wrote, well, maybe I should use book in quotes, because I did write it. I just didn't release it yet. And that is the, I'm calling it Beyond the Classroom is Lean Six Sigma Right for Me. All the things that you don't learn in the classroom all the, the life points, the learning areas that you learn mm, by accident to ask yourself, is this, do I want to do this kind of job? Do I want to live the life of a black belt? Yes, this, I believe in the skills. I believe in the need for the programs. But I also believe that you should be aware and be more... Uh, I guess informed. You should be informed that what this life can be like. And if you look at your leadership, do you have the right leadership in your area to be successful in this kind of role? Are you politically good or are you just more technical? Will you be allowed, afforded the opportunity to make mistakes in your role or will that be the kiss of death? What would happen if you're victor victorious? Who stands to lose face when you come out above? When you're celebrating your victories or somebody secretly trying to plot your demise? You may think that doing right for the company puts you up, but you know that's there's always a target on the back of the of the winner, and uh, there is always somebody, even though you may be doing well for them and. They may hold you in high regard on one hand, but they may consider you a threat on, on the other hand. So consider that when you're getting into these change agent types of roles, Lean, Six Sigma, engineering, project management, quality improvement, whatever it is. Change means somebody, means breaking the status quo. If you want change to happen, you actually need to break the status quo. Things will get more difficult. For, especially for the people who are fighting to keep the status quo. And based on the BISC model, about a quarter of the people, maybe even half, are fighting to keep the status quo as a, as a matter of their own nature. In a world where not everybody can be winners, unless you're a millennial and you're on a, on a t-ball team, everybody's a winner. <laughs> In a world where not everybody can be winners, if you're winning, 
that means somebody is losing. You know, and, and it's just awful. It should not be that way. It really shouldn't because you're doing for the good of the company and every, everybody benefits for the good of the company. So you may make the company a lot more money and everybody may prosper, but there's still a nagging feeling in some pe- back of some people's minds that, but I've also taken a hit to my ego and they made me look bad some way, somehow. Um, so I, I really do believe that, you know, that's the price of victory. If you're winning in this project, who could be potentially losing in this project? And if you think about that early enough, this is about stakeholder engagement. If you think about that early enough, maybe you can have them coming out be the winner. And you have to take a step back and not and be the, the second winner. And, uh, and then the losers, there'll still be some losers there. But the losers hopefully will not be in such a powerful position that they have to make any retaliation. They can just fade in the background and say, okay, we're doing things a little bit differently now, and whatever they come up with won't be so damaging. So consider that. I think that's the only lesson. Okay, beating a deer fly, the price of victory. If you've got any stories like this, I'd sure love to hear them. Uh, Feel free to email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at e6s-methods.com. I don't want to be the only one with a sob story about being so good at my job. So if you've got a sob story about how good you were at your job and it led to, you know, a, uh, a less than ideal situation, you were really good at a project and you think that that may have led to maybe you got fired, maybe you got uh, demoted or put somewhere else where you uh, didn't belong, whatever, let me know. I'd like to hear it. All right. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to episode 205 of the E6S Methods Podcast. Don't forget to click like or dislike for this episode in the show notes. Tap click done. If you have a question, comment, or advice, leave a note in the comments section or contact us directly. Feel free to email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at E6S-Methods.com or on our website. We reply to all messages. If you heard something you like, then share us with a friend or leave a review. Didn't like what you heard? Join our LinkedIn group and tell us why. Don't forget, you can find notes and graphics for all shows and more at www.e6s-methods.com. Journey through success. If you're not climbing up, you're falling down.